I went from zero publications to getting published and an NIH funded grant in two and a half years. So what changed? Hi, this is Dr. Jia and today I'm going to share the eight habits I have learned that have served me well. Number one, invest money into self-education. One of the biggest issue I had was writing papers. So if you don't know how to write papers, run statistics, take a course, buy a book, get a coach. Don't wait for the skills to come to you. And people talk about investment all the time and the biggest investment is in yourself. The value does not depreciate. Also, these investment buy you time, so it speeds things up for you, speeds up your career uh, for you. One more key thing about is investing in yourself is don't ask if you will get a return of investment in it from it. Decide that you will get an ROI from it. Whether it is a $10 book or a 5,000 grant writing bootcamp, put all of your effort to get the most value out of the price you've paid for. I sometimes also hear people say, oh, my institution is not paying for it, so I will not take the course. Certainly, institutions should be providing some CME money or uh, continuous medical education to support your career development. But if they have limited funds and can't do it, you should consider buying it for yourself. If not, who are you really punishing? Yourself. And remember, even if you leave your institution, you bring the new skills with you. Number two, study the people you aspire to become. Look for the scientists or peers or physicians who are successful and learn from them. If you can, meet, meet with them to get advice. Now, be careful when you ask for, ask for advice. Some will, get, some will start getting rose-colored uh, tinted glasses of their journey and they forget all the hard work and things they have done. So they give you generic advice such as follow your passion. That is not helpful. So what you want to know is what they actually did during that stage in order to be successful. So when they start giving you generic advice, pivot and ask targeted questions such as, um, what do you think were the habits, habits that made you successful? What pitfalls to avoid? When you were at my stage, what is the one thing you would have done differently? Or what is the one thing you would do differently if you were to start over? And keep a folder of all these notes from, the, from these conversations and go back and read them. Importantly, when you see this pattern, you want to implement these habits for yourself. Number three, say yes to things outside of your comfort zone. Whether it is a speaking opportunity, a leadership role, an opportunity to write a paper, or take on a new project that uses a new study method that you've never tried before, Try it. I tend to commit first, then I'll somehow figure it out later. We often hear the what ifs. What if I fail? What if I don't know what to do? What if I mess up? What if I, what if I don't have the time? But we forget the positive side of what ifs. What if I pull through? Uh, what if I publish this paper? What skills would I have gained? And what new doors would open? Uh, and then this brings me to the common question. What if I say yes too much? Great question. So I have some safeguard for that. And this brings me to number four. I tend to make decisions before the opportunity comes. So what do I mean? Before you get into the situation, have your presets or have your decision made ahead of time. So there are many things in your career or your life that you have to make decisions for. But more often than not, these situations can be predicted. For example, people will be asking you to join committees, uh, take on new projects, take on new role, adding a new patient to your schedule, or in your personal life, like what food to eat, who will pick the kids from the soccer game. So before these situations come, make a list of always and a list of nevers to guide decisions. So I do this all the time and it makes my life so much simpler because I just have fewer decisions to make. So in other words, I already have some algorithm in my mind on what decisions to make. For example, I use a certain uh, criteria when I ch choose to take on research project. Usually it's based on three criteria. So a research project that I take on must either be aligned, completely aligned with my research interests, complementary to my research interests, or if not, the project will allow me to collaborate with someone in my research field of interest, or I get to gain a specific skill. Some examples of new skills I consider new study technique, new statistical method. Uh, maybe now I am working on the, a multi-site study. I want to learn from the group and the principal investigator on how to handle that. Now, what about my nevers? Um, I never take on projects where I am not contributing much or not learning much. At this stage of my career, I'm focusing on only original research uh, uh, studies. So I say to myself, I don't do case reports unless I'm the first few people who learn about Ebola or some sort of new disease, I will not likely write a case report. 
Number five, find multiple mentors. In academia, there is this myth that we need one good research mentor. Actually, that's not true. In fact, what you need is a mentoring committee. One could be for career advice. One could be on a specific expertise in a study method. Another one could be a sponsor, somebody who will help you con who will help connect you with others, talk you up, promote to others. Another one could be for their leadership skills. And don't forget um, books, audio programs, YouTube. I have mentors who don't even know who I am. Number six, be intentional about what you feed your mind. Trade social media or news for books. In fact, read good books several times and we often miss many of the gems during the first read. I listen and read books at the same time. Also, read books outside of your field. A few of my best research ideas did not really come from journal articles, but came from business and psychology books. Number seven, master the art of self-discipline. One advice I learned from Benjamin Hardy is that 100% is easier than 99%. It takes the decision out of your head. For example, it is easier to take on a habit of exercising um, when you do it every day rather than three times a week. Because once you say, I only do it three times a week, there will be so many decisions you would have to make. For example, uh, three times a week, which day? Is it Monday, Wednesday, Friday? Uh, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, weekend only. Now, ever since I've adopted daily exercise, I rarely miss a session. Now, the key tip about keeping your daily habit is you need to have a contingency plan for when you are in a busy season or ill. That way, you don't derail so easily. For example, my contingency plan for exercise is if I'm ill, I will only do stretching and also maybe just do a few rubber bands. If one of your goal is to write daily, there will be days where things are hectic or you have no motivation. So your contingency plan could be to do 10 minutes of putting words down on paper and it does not even have to be good. So usually that's good enough. Number eight, work on your paper generating activities or I like to call it PGAs. To be successful in business, you must do revenue generating activities. So I've adapted this into research. Every workday, I need to do at least one paper generating activity or one PGA. These are activities that will directly move a research paper forward. So it's not learning about writing or watching a YouTube video about statistics, but, act, but have an actual output. So these activities count. Writing a research protocol, data collection, data analysis, manuscript writing, editing, uh, filling up a journal submission form, or responding to reviewers. So these are the eight habits that help transform my academic career. If you like this video, give me a thumbs up. So I've also learned many things from my mentors. If you wanna know what makes them successful, be sure to watch this next video. I'll see you there.